In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, um, and welcome back to all of our Institute of Catholic Culture friends here for our Roman Catholic lectionary reflection for the 18th Sunday in Ordinary Time, which is also the 8th Sunday after Pentecost. Um, and I mention that because the church, as I've been saying in the last few weeks, or last, I guess, eight weeks, we continue to live in this cycle in which we are in the light of Pentecost. And that cycle is going to continue on now all the way up to really the beginning of the church year and or the traditional beginning of the church year and, uh, and the feast of the exaltation of the Holy Cross on September 14th, in which then now we'll start the cycle in which we prepare for the advent of Christ uh, and uh, the feast of the nativity, the feast of Christmas. But, but here we're still living in this cycle of this post Pentecost or the light of Pentecost in the spirit of Pentecost in which the apostles go out into the world and, and they're challenged as much as we are challenged today. And we're, we're meant to, by the church, take those challenges and then apply them to our life, realizing that we're not alone, but we stand in the company of the saints who are there to strengthen us uh, in this mission that we have been given to bring Christ out into the world. And certainly our world is, is, is in need of Christ today, but no more than the world was in need of Christ at the time of the apostles in which they went out to a pagan world um, that was far from God and then preached the good news of the resurrection. So with that background, let's take a look here. Let me give you the biblical text. You can write these down for yourself. Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 2, and then chapter 2, verse 21 through 23. Okay, the responsorial psalm is taken from Psalm 90. Psalm 90. The uh, gospel text is that of Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, verse 13 through 21. And we'll take, as we usually do, the epistle last, because we're trying to get the historical context in which these texts are written. Of course, the epistles are written, or at least they recount the life of the church following the life of Christ. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 through 5 and 9 through 11. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 through 5 and 9 through 11. So here we are. We're going to start out now with Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 2, and chapter 2, verse 21 through 23. Vanity of vanities, says Koheleth. Vanity of vanities, all things are vanity. Here is one who has labored with wisdom and knowledge and skill, and yet to another who has not labored over it, he must leave property. This also is vanity and a great misfortune. For what profit comes to man from all the toil and anxiety of heart with which he has labored under the sun? All his days, sorrow and grief are his occupation. Even at night, his mind is not at rest. This is also vanity. Well, there you go, Father Sebastian. Have a nice day. <laughs> vanity of vanities. First of all, well, as usually, I ask you, you know, for the context here, who is this Koholoth guy? Yeah, he sounds like a pretty depressed guy. <laughs> uh, so, Koheleth is, as we read, now the, the lectionary has skipped the beginning here. It's just giving us the heart of what the church wants us to, to hear for the moment. But context is really important here. The first line of the first chapter says this, the words of the preacher or the Koheleth or the Ecclesiastikos, the Greek word there, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. So a Koheleth is, this is just a Hebrew word, meaning the the leader of the assembly. Well, the assembly, the kohol of Israel or kohol of God, that's, that's the people of God. And so he's the leader, he's the king. And so, um, so you could really just switch out this word koholeth in the Hebrew or the Greek word ecclesiastikos with just simply the word king in this particular context, leader of God's people in a certain sense. And so as we read the text, 
when we first start reading it, or maybe we should read a little sample from it, it sounds like this is a very depressed individual. <laughs> and it's a book that I don't want to keep reading because I'm just going to get more depressed. It's actually one of my most favorite books, the Old Testament. And it's because if you read the text carefully and in the context, 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 context of the life of Solomon, it makes a lot of sense. And in, it's an, a great source of incredible wisdom for us today. And so what we find in the story is this is Solomon at the end of his life. <clears throat> and most of us know the story of Solomon well enough to know that he spent his life pursuing wealth, power, pleasure, you name it, he had it, and in great abundance. And what he concludes throughout this book is that none of those things satisfy the hunger he had. Mm -hmm. He was hungry, and so he filled himself with pleasure, but he was still hungry. He was hungry, so he tried filling himself with power, and he was still hungry. He was hungry, so he gathered great wealth, but he was still hungry. So he was hungry, and so he, he planted vineyards and, and built buildings, and, and he looked out over his balconies over it all, and he was still hungry. And so he was realizing that, there was, that, that the things of this world are not, there's nothing wrong with them. But they themselves, in and of themselves, as ends in themselves, cannot satisfy. <laughs> and so that's one of the main themes throughout the book. And then another theme that we hear wrapped into the lecture here is that he begins to realize that a lot of what he's been doing in his life is for the next day, for the future. So he's been building wealth so that he'll have great wealth. He's been building power so that he'll have great power. He's been building and planting vineyards and so he can eat of the fruit. He's been doing all this stuff, building houses so he can, building so he can live in them, enjoy them. And he's realizing that what he's doing is he's living in the future. And that future may never come. And in fact, he realizes that not only will that future may never come, he does not know the day he will die. But in the end, there's another future he needs to be concerned about because in the end he will die. The day of his death is drawing near. And as he's getting older, he's beginning to realize how futile all of these pursuits have been in his life. And that what he should have been doing all of his life was doing this. And you hear this throughout the, the epistle. This is a great message for us is living life to the fullness in the day that has been given to us from God. And he, he doesn't mean just, you know, party it up, the whole day. <clears throat> but what he means is living the, and enjoying the life God has given you now. Enjoying breakfast. Enjoying the time with your family you have right there at that moment. Enjoying work as you are laboring. Plant, his, his message is don't plant a tree so that you can pick of its, eat, enjoy its fruit someday in the future. That's fine. But you may never do that. What you must do is learn how to enjoy planting the tree, regardless of whether you will eat of the fruit. And so you need to have your whole, your whole life has to be ordered toward, which he, which he says in the last chapter of the book, toward aligning your will in your daily life, in every moment, every breath, with the will of God. And in that, in keeping the commandments of God, and living your life in accord with God's life, is in the end, the whole purpose of man. You know, the uh, responsorial psalm that is given to us this Sunday, if today you hear his voice, harden not your hearts. And I come back to that, that line in the Old Testament reading, for what profit comes to a man from all the toil and anxiety of his heart? And I think there's a big, uh, very much a catechetical lesson for us today this, of course, as I said, is given to us in terms of the apostolic age, the preaching of the apostles, the going out beyond their homes to a foreign land in which they, they struggle with this question of will God take care of them? And we've, we've seen this a theme uh, building here in over the, over the past few weeks about this dependency upon the Lord. We got that in the, uh, that, beautiful, that beautiful gospel text in which Jesus says, look at the birds of the air and the flowers of the field right from the Mount of Beatitudes is standing there and, and, and with the wild parakeets flying around and the beautiful wild flowers. He says, look at these things. Says, Do you think God's going to take care of you anything any less than that? 
and a reminder to the apostles that their mission is going to, to require a total dependency upon the Lord. And, and, and as I said, this is a big warning for us today. As we chant these psalms this Sunday, this responsorial psalm, if today you hear his voice, harden not your hearts. So we have the answer of how your heart gets hardened. There's a very simple way in which your heart gets hardened, and that's given to us in that Old Testament reading. For what profit comes to a man from all the toil and anxiety of his heart? From all that toil and anxiety comes a hardness of heart in which I focus my life upon what, like you were saying, the power I'm going to achieve, the large house I'm going to get, the retirement I'm going to have, the, all of these things that the world places before us as things in which I place my dependency and really the struggle and purpose of my life. But Solomon has come to a realization maybe in his last days in which he looks at all of this. He says it's all, all, all of it is just, as Jesus says, rusting away, decaying. It's eaten by moths and, and so forth, that, that all of this is passing away. And if we allow ourselves to become so focused upon those things, our heart will become hardened and we'll be unable to hear the voice of God. You know, I had that beautiful, maybe I'm getting a little bit sidetracked here, but I think, it's, I think it's worth saying. We have that beautiful story of the prophet Elijah. And when he's hiding up in the cave, when Jezebel's hunting him, and it says that there was a great earthquake and God, and the Lord was not in the earthquake. There was a great fire and the Lord was not in the fire. And there's oh yeah, all these things, these traumatic, you know, big, big, but, but there was, then there was a, sm a still small voice. And Elijah wrapped his face and bowed down to worship the Lord. That it is in that still small voice, if you will, that we're going to find the, our communion with God. But so sad, today we become, our hearts become hardened by all of the noise going on around us and all of the attractions of the world. As the apostles are going out into the world, they're facing this very problem, this very struggle that we also face. This is why the communion of saints is so important, that we are not the first ones to face these things, that we chant these things. Do not harden your heart. Lord, allow my, my heart not to be hardened by this constant attraction to achievement as, as far as our society places it before us. And listen to this in the Alleluia verse given to us in Matthew chapter 5, verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Of course, this is given on the Mount of Beatitudes, right? The same place that Jesus is saying, look at the birds of the air and, the, and, and so forth. Blessed are the poor in spirit. I remember Archbishop Elias Shakur commenting on this passage. He says, he says, the poor one is the one who is in need. He's hungry. You're mentioning being hungry. And the one who is hungry in spirit is the one who has this deep desire for the right things. There shall be the kingdom of God. Those are the ones that will achieve the kingdom of heaven, will achieve or, be, or receive, I should say, will receive this fullness of God's life because they opened their heart to desire that reality apart from the reality that Solomon had been pursuing all of his life. Let's take a look at the gospel text, Luke chapter, Luke chapter 12, Luke chapter 12, verse 13 through 21. Luke chapter 12, verse 13 through 21. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to share the inheritance with me. I'm going to stop there for a minute, Father Sebastian, because notice how the church has brought together this Old Testament reading. It says, Here is one who has labored with wisdom and knowledge and skill, and yet another who has not labored over it. He must leave to him, to him, he must leave his property. So there's a whole, this whole theme of, of inheritance and also this theme of greed that's coming forward here. Someone in the crowd, going back to Luke, someone in the crowd said to Jesus, teacher, tell my brother to share the inheritance with me. He replied to him, friend, who appointed me as your judge and arbitrator? Uh, then he said to the crowd, take care to guard against all greed. For though one may be rich, one's life does not consist of possessions. Then he told them a parable. There was a rich man whose land produced a bountiful harvest. He asked himself, what shall I do? For I do not have the space to store my harvest. And he said, this is what I shall do. I shall tear down my barns and build larger ones. There I shall store all my grain and other goods. And I shall say to myself, now as for you, 
You have so many good things stored up for many years. Rest, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this night your life will be demanded of you, and the things you have, re have prepared, to whom will they belong? Thus will it be for all who store up treasure for themselves, but are not rich in what matters to God. Father Sebastian, uh, quickly to give us the context here in Luke chapter 12. Okay, so the, um, we're right around the middle of the Galilean ministry in Luke's gospel here. And as Luke often does, he shows us, Paul, uh, shows us Jesus's focus on the poor. So there's a theme in Luke's gospel, which is highlighted more than any of the other gospels, is the contrast between the life of the rich and the life of the poor. You can think of, for example, the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Right? So this is a, one of those Luke and uh, images. And so here we find an example of an individual who's just like that parable about the rich man Lazarus. You have, you have a man who has been given by God all that he needs, plus a massive amount of excess. And, and he's expected to, by God, to share that excess, to give the excess that he does not need more than rather than storing it up for another time for the future, but live of what he needs for the day, eat what he needs for that day. And the excess that he has for that day, rather than store it up for the future, to give it to those who are in need for that day. And that parable of the rich man Lazarus, here you have a poor man who's living at the very gate of the, of the house of the guy, while the guy's in there stuffing himself with food and crumbs and stuff's falling off the table. Lazarus is out there starving to death. And, uh, and while the rich man is clothed in fine clothing and purple, excessive wealth, right? All of the excess, all, all the things he had in excess, he was using and storing up for the future as opposed to taking that excess, living on what he needed. God doesn't want the rich man to be hungry or to be naked or, or no, poor. No, he wants the rich man to have what he needs, but then to give, take that excess and give to Lazarus or give to the, the poor man at his gate or who are around him. And so we, we find here this example of this guy who obviously has way more abundance of a crop. You know, when we have, a, when we have maybe in our, our fruit trees or our, our vegetable gardens in our houses, our yards, if we have them, we often have all of a sudden a massive surge of, of, of food. What are we going to do with it? Well, what you should do with it is, Take that excess and give it away to someone around you, to someone else who has it. And often you'll find that those who then have excess when you don't have a vegetable garden growing or fruit trees or don't have maybe enough, then suddenly out of nowhere, that excess will come also to us, right? This is why God gives us that excess for, for those around us who are in need. Give us an opportunity to share, to give to be like God, who is the great giver. Yeah, I think there's such a difference in attitude between, say, we could say Solomon's early life in which he is, or this man here, where he is achieving for himself all of these great things, rather than realizing that the things he has are a gift from God and then are to be used accordingly. And the church fathers love to use this image of the man building the barn to say, look, let the, let the poor be your barn. Uh, and St. John Chrysostom makes a comment like this. He says, he says, see that extra coat you have in your closet? That coat is the poor man's coat. That's not yours. You have it so that you can give it to him. What a change of, of mindset, attitude, way of life that is for the Christian who realizes we've been, we're living in this kind of American society, struggling, struggling to get ahead, and it's mine, it's mine, it's mine. What a change this is when the person realizes life as a gift from God. All things in, that I have as a gift from God. You know, we oftentimes, because we're Americans, we talk in terms of money, and it's, it's because of that, it's a, usually a great example for us of the spiritual life and of the challenge of the spiritual life. What a difference there is between those who find that this giving of self is the only authentic way to happiness. I see this among 
my parishioners, among uh, members of the Institute, who have this joy of giving away, you know, and I, I speak in terms of, of money because, because it's, again, we're living this American society in which, this, in which all of our things are said, put in terms of, of money. There becomes this ease and happiness of giving away. It's because it's, it's in that that we discover, we discover the way of God who gives his life to us. You know, we pick this whole theme up in the epistle. And as we look there to realize that, that this gospel text, the Old Testament, is not given to us merely on the material, the money level, if you will, material level or on the things level. But on the spiritual level is that verse from, from Matthew chapter 5, the verse that we chant in the Alleluia given to us. That there's a poorness also. There's a, a poorness of spirit. There's a need on the spiritual level. Oftentimes, we're looking merely at the physical needs around us. Oftentimes, I encourage people, there's a great poverty in our society, which goes way beyond the poverty that we see on the streets. It's a spiritual poverty. And that poverty goes beyond our streets, through the walls of our yards, and into the houses, and into the mansions, and into the homes, and into the cars of every single American. There's a, a poverty but unfortunately, for many, there's a blindness, an unawareness of the poverty. And therefore, there's no real hunger that is cultivated for the things of God. We, of course, realizing that must become ones who, who begin to feed in that way, to begin to serve in that way, to provide others for the, the things they need to kind of be filled up. Um, and, uh, and we get that here, this understanding of our life not merely in the, in the, on the material level, but on the, the level of a newness of life we've been given here in the epistle in Colossians chapter 3. Colossians 3, verse 1 through 5 and 9 through 11. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 through 5 and then 9 through 11. Brothers and sisters, if you were raised with Christ, seek what is above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Think of what is above, not of what is on the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, your life, appears, then you too will appear with him in glory. Put to death, then, the parts of you that are earthly, Im immortality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and the greed that is idolatry. Stop lying to one another, since you have taken off the old self with its practices and then put on the new self, which is being renewed for the knowledge in the image of its creator, there is no Greek or Jew, circumcised, circumcision or uncircumcision, barbarian or Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all in all. Father Sebastian, Colossians is not one of those texts that most people are reading on a daily basis, so maybe you can make, help us understand what's going on, uh, why St. Paul is saying what he's saying to this particular community, especially in regards to this, uh, this aspect of you have died to yourself that you might live in a newness of life. Sure. So, so the, the church in Colossae uh, is in Asia Minor. It's over on that east coast of, not on the coast itself, but inland a bit, on that east side, I'm sorry, east side, on the west side of Turkey, modern-day Turkey, we can see on the map there that you're pulling up there, yeah, you can see Colossae there. This is one of the epistles that Paul wrote while he was in captivity. It was one of the captivity epistles. And so Paul writes to the church in Colossae, and he reminds them of a couple of things that are really important for our, our theme today. But most importantly, as you just mentioned, this theme of dying or have, having died, you know, when did, when did you die? Well, yeah. Paul, if you read I'm all... Stop, you know what, Father Sebastian? I'm going to stop right now and ask a really important question to all of our participants. What's St. Paul talking about? If, if, you, if, if reading that epistle, one word does not pop into your mind, which my brother's about to say, <laughs> then we have a major catechetical crisis going on, even among the members of the Institute of Catholic Culture. I hope to God, when you heard those words, you've died and you have a newness of life, you know exactly what St. Paul's talking about. Father Sebastian, lay it on us. 
right. So if we're reading the whole Pauline epistle, now again, it just, all you need is this little section here. And this is all of Pauline theology wrapped up in one. Right. You, you can hear everything Paul says in all of his epistles right here. At least is his, his, the heart of his theology. And, and you can even see it earlier in this chapter, in the previous chapter in this epistle, where he says in chapter 2, verse 11, in Christ you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, by putting off the body of the flesh and the circumcision of Christ, and you were buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. So that's that, what Paul says there, what Paul says in the, the passage we just read, is the same thing that Paul says in Galatians chapter 3, what he says in, in Romans chapter 6, mm -hmm. that we who have repented of this, of our, of the ways of this world and have turned back to God and have been baptized into Christ, we have been, we have died with him, we have been buried with him, and we have been raised with him to newness of life. So when Paul talks about, I was crucified with Christ or I died with Christ, he's talking about, you have to read it, all the places where he uses that language, he's talking about his baptism into Christ in which he was fully immersed in the waters of baptism like like you know noah and the in the in the uh and the people in the in the ark with them coming out of the, the the flood waters or like the israelites coming out of the 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 red sea he's a new creation in christ and he sees all christians in that way therefore whether you were circumcised or you were uncircumcised whether you were a barbarian that is a, a non-greek speaker or a, a Scythian that is way, way up in the, the uh, up in the northeast air region, up, up but almost really into almost uh, southern modern Russia, that area, way off in barbarian and pagan lands, wherever you're from, whatever your background is, if you've been baptized in Christ, you die with Him, and you've been raised with Him in newness of life, and and being raised with Him in newness of life, you now await a bodily resurrection that will come the spiritual resurrection that happens to us in baptism chrismation and the reception of the holy eucharist will bear fruit in a bodily resurrection in which christ says he eats my flesh and drinks my blood has life in him and i will raise him up on the last day this is why we believe in the real presence of the eucharist it is really the body and blood of jesus because we're going to have a real body and blood raised at the end of time and so now as paul says we got to think about what we're going to do in between these two resurrections. You know, that question of what we're going to do is, is exactly what the church is placing before us today in the image of Solomon, who at the end of his life has toiled in anxiety over the things of this world and has realized in our life is about something more than that. Uh, we have been given a newness of life in baptism. So sad. So often I see people who, you know, they have their child baptized, but then they're, they go about their life as though nothing has happened. And so I, you know, I, I asked them, how is your life different than your neighbors? If someone comes and sees you living your life and they look at your neighbor living his life, are they going to say, now there is a Catholic. Say, there is a follower of Christ. Do you see how different his life is? And if, if not, then I would, I, I challenge our participants today to say, how am I living this newness of life which Christ has given me? Am I still going about my life as I did before? Anxious about the things of this world. Anxious about, you know, building bigger barns so that I can store up more of this. And so, or have we truly given, relied upon the Lord and then used all the gifts God has given to us, realizing all, all that we have is a gift, then in service to him. Father Sebastian, you have this great image. I, I, I love, when I first heard you say it, I, 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 I wasn't, know, you, to be honest with you, I wasn't 100% sure about it. The more I thought about it, I thought, wow, what an insight about the apostles and how when they left the, their boat behind. But then in a chapter or two later, they come back and they bring Jesus to their boat. It's not so much an abandonment of our life. It's not so much that the fact the guy has a great harvest, he's got all that stuff, is a bad thing. It's just, it's, it's how we're using it. And now the apostles give us this image of bringing their whole life to the ministry of Christ. 
I would encourage our participants, those are, that, are, that are listening and, and studying with us today, to consider this question. And, and then, uh, really, I, I do believe, and this is why I've given much of my life to the mission of the Institute of Catholic Culture, that we have an, an opportunity here that this mission is our mission. And that is to bring the gift of the kingdom of heaven, that is, the realization of the truth of Christ in the church, to those who are truly suffering and poor in our society, not just physically, but spiritually poor, that we might minister to them with the truth of Christ uh, taught by all of the wonderful teachers. Let me tell you right now, I'm just going to have a moment to give you a, a, maybe a little witness from my own life. It was when I was learning from great teachers like, uh, like Dr. Cutterback, Dr. Marshner, Dr. O'Donnell, Father Scalia, Monsignor Pope, and others. is life-changing for me. I hope it's been life-changing for you. And if you say, Father, it has been. You know, be, having an opportunity to prepare for Sunday, the Sunday readings here together uh, has, ch been, uh, cha has changed how I approach the liturgy on Sunday. And when I learn from a great teacher like Dr. Cutterback, it's life change. I see, I see my life in a different way. Then, then we have a mission to give that to others. There's a reason why I don't teach a lot at the Institute of Catholic Culture, not anymore. I don't do a lot of the teaching. Because there's other guys that can just, that can teach so much better than I can. And, they, and it's my mission, my life, to bring those great teachers to other people. And in that way, to, to minister to those who are poor of spirit, that they might become rich in the kingdom of heaven. In light of the readings that are given to us this coming Sunday, I, I invite you to lend your hands to our work, to realize that the gifts God has given us in our life ought to be used for the service of one another, uh, that the light of Christ, which we have shining in our hearts might also begin to shine brightly in those around us. Uh, I ask for your generosity to the Institute of Catholic Culture, and I'm proud to do so because it's been life-changing for me, and I hope it's been life-changing for you. Together, we can bring that gift of Christ to others. To him be glory both now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen.